All right, we are now really going to dive into what was just discussed on our regional economy with some panelists. And as they get the chairs set up, we'd like to invite those panelists up uh, to join us on stage. Of course, we're going to have Tatiana part of the panel, Mayor Southers, County Commissioner Stan Vanderwerf, and Executive Director of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, Andrew Gunning. Please make your way up and give it up for our panelists. So we have this microphone, and then they have one other microphone. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's perfect. Go ahead. So, as has already been announced, you can tweet in your questions using the hashtag econ forum. Also in your program, there are those note cards, which you can write down your questions, and we have the ushers that will be bringing up those questions so they can be asked from the stage. To start, how about we have each individual panelist, other than Tatiana, since we know where her focus has been, over 40 presentations per year, covering uh, all the data that she gathers. How about we have each panelist introduce themselves and talk about what they are focused on as it relates to a lot of the data that was just presented, especially when it comes to the challenges and opportunities that we have here in the Pikes Peak region. Would you like to start, Andrew? Sure, thank you. Uh, this is on. Um, with the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, we deal with uh, transportation planning, environmental planning, water quality and air quality, uh, planning around our uh, military bases uh, to prevent encroachment, and also deal with senior issues, um, aging needs throughout our, our three county region in El Paso, Teller, and Park counties. Probably the, the biggest thing that we're focused with right now and ties in a lot with what Tatiana was talking about was how are we going to fund our infrastructure, on our, especially on our state transportation system. We're doing a ton of really good work at the local, regional level. Uh, we have a, a five-jurisdiction regional transportation authority, which invests a ton of money into our regional uh, roadway network, a lot of work that's happening at the city with um, 2C. But where we're not seeing that kind of investment is on the state system. And this all needs to work together as an integrated system. Um, and think about improvements on... I-25, uh, US-24, Powers Boulevard, um, Highway 94, routes like that. We've all got to be able to get around, not just within our, our local and regional streets, um, but there's a real breakdown there, and we can maybe talk about that a little bit further, but that, that's kind of the biggest challenge that, that we're dealing with right now. Perfect. Commissioner Vanderwerf? Yes, hello, I'm Stan Vanderwerf. I'm one of the El Paso County Commissioners, and I represent the west side of El Paso County, but us five commissioners, we really represent uh, everybody throughout El Paso County. Uh, we have a great county, it's one of the best in the nation, but we also have a series of challenges. One of those is obviously transportation and infrastructure. We do have uh, 2,200 miles of roads, uh, and that's a big challenge trying to maintain those, and it was stated correctly, half of those are actually unpaved. So there's quite a lot of roads out in eastern El Paso County that can be challenging for us. We're doing a lot of investing in the capital equipment that is used to actually maintain those roads because economic times are good and that's allowing us to do that investment. Uh, also, other uh, challenges that we have is with uh, just the growth that's taking place in the county. This is very challenging. So one of the things that's important to us is to have a thoughtful land use policy. We have a lot of well-developed and sophisticated policy where the developers have thousands of requirements that they have to meet, but because it's stated up front, they know what we're looking for when they come before us and ask for approval. So we've been having a lot of opportunity to address the supply component of uh, the uh, growth that we have in El Paso County, and there's more things I'll talk about with that. So thank you very much. Perfect. And then last but certainly not least, Mayor Southers. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. When I became the mayor in 2015 uh, and had the dialogue with the voters uh, leading up to that, it was pretty clear what the challenges facing uh, the Pikes Peak region were and uh, as demonstrated by some of the charts you saw today. Uh, we had to do a lot better job in job creation. Uh, we needed to deal with uh, uh, critical public infrastructure. And of course, one of the things we also needed to do uh, was uh, create a much more collaborative political environment because that had held us back over the uh, previous several years. I think we've made tremendous progress and I think that uh, the numbers that you saw today uh, reflect that. Uh, moving forward, uh, have to stay focused on job creation and the one that keeps me up tonight, uh, at night that was referred to uh, is uh, infrastructure. Um, 
what I feel very good, the, the best about in terms of political leadership that's happened in uh, Colorado Springs is we have convinced our voters, uh, I believe that uh, investment in critical public infrastructure uh, is, uh, you know, not only results in better roads, uh, but uh, helps enhance massive private uh, investment that we're seeing at this point in time. But the fact of the matter is uh, we can't solve this infrastructure problem ourselves. Uh, as was alluded to, uh, we need help. Uh, we can fix our own local roads, uh, but uh, we've got to have attention to uh, powers, uh, uh, State Highway 21, uh, Nevada, uh, South Highway 15, uh, Highway uh, 94 out to Shreve Air Force Base, particularly if we have uh, U.S. Space Command. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, we got to get the state off the dime. I think we're going to have some discussion about we can't look to the federal government uh, to fix this problem. It's not going to happen like it did in the 50s with a massive uh, interstate uh, highway system. To the extent the federal government gives us any money, uh, we're going to have to match it on the state level. And I see no political leadership uh, in the state of Colorado uh, stepping up to deal with the infrastructure issues that the state is uh, facing. Thank you. Speaking of infrastructure there, and what was brought up in uh, both presentations, with the studies of a passenger rail between Denver and Colorado Springs. This is something that has been done before, it's been looked at before, and it seems to have a resurgence in the discussion. Do you think the Front Range passenger rail that is being studied is being studied now is possible this time around? And if so, what is going to be different this time that will actually end up with it being built? That would be um, the mayor, even Andy, uh, and Tatiana, maybe from an economic endpoint. Uh, first of all, what's going to drive it uh, is necessity. We've talked about it before, but you know we've got uh, several million more people uh, than we had when we uh, started the discussion. So I, I think there's a sense that it has to happen. Uh, the state's going to be uh, uh, eight million people uh, by uh, uh, 2050. If you don't have rapid transit uh, up the front uh, range, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, I think that we're going to have some very interesting discussions because uh, when I go to U.S. Uh, Conference of Mayors uh, meetings, uh, basically they tell the, those of us that don't have rapid transit yet, you may be better off because the technology is changing so quickly, uh, y you can jump on the new wave of, of technology. And I think that's what uh, the state of Colorado uh, is going to have to do, but it, it's going to have to happen, uh, and I do think uh, we're beginning to gain uh, the political will uh, to make it happen. Andy, would you like to add to that? Sure, and just to add on that, uh, we actually have a, a commission, a Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, that's actually studying this in earnest right now, and they're doing, doing the right thing. They're doing a feasibility study to look at different technologies. It may not be super high speed, like 110 miles per hour, but might be 80 miles per hour. Uh, they're looking at alignments. Um, they're looking at a governance structure, looking at how you might pay for the capital and the operating costs. And we'll know a lot more by, by next year. But if that pencils out, then um, we should really take, seriously take a look at that. But it's really going to require a lot of leadership, and not really just political leadership, but the business community stepping up and saying that this is really important. Um, but the forecast that I've seen, we're going to try to have to figure out how to move about 6.6 .6 million people up and down the front range. We've got 4.8 million people, I think, today, roughly from Fort Collins down to Pueblo. And from here to Denver, as we know, we're connected by one interstate and, and two little state roads. And that, that really concerns me. So we've got to look at some other options. And for a lot of the reasons that, that Tatiana mentioned, our demographics are, are changing. So there's different expectations around how we travel, especially with our younger generation. We're also getting older. I think by 2040, one in five of our residents in Colorado will be 65 or over. So they're not going to want to have to navigate that, that trip by, by car necessarily. So to be competitive, we really do need to look at some other options. And you look to the west, I think Utah was mentioned as, as an example. They have about an 80-plus uh, mile uh, line, passenger uh, commuter, passenger rail line in place already from Ogden to Provo, I believe it is. And they're planning for an expansion maybe out to 130 miles. So other states that we compete with are, are looking at and, and doing these things already. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions on population and even more questions on other modes of transportation. So other than the connection between Colorado Springs and Denver, what else do we need to look at as a growing city to ensure that our population, specifically uh, or even including our lower uh, socioeconomical population, so that they can 
get around town and get access uh, to jobs and the services that they are employed. Who wants to challenge that one? Well, let me, let me throw a little dose of realism on that. Um, <laughs> we apparently are not sufficiently urbanized yet to drive a lot of people to uh, mass trans uh, transportation, for, for example, our mountain metro bus system. Let me just give you a couple of facts. You, you know what it costs to park downtown uh, if, if you work downtown for a month? 30 bucks. You know what it costs to park in downtown Denver a month if you work in downtown Denver? You know, 400 bucks. Uh, if you come downtown uh, in the evening to go to a restaurant, you park in a city parking garage, it's one dollar after four o'clock. Have you tried to park in Denver lately? Um, so, uh, and as much as we, we have a notion that our uh, traffic is increasing on the interstate when we go home, uh, if, you know, if you watch real carefully, it's still moving. Um, <laughs> and so we don't yet, what we have, what we have to have a bus system for half two riders. And 60% of the people who ride Mountain Metro have to to go to work, 40% have to to go to school. We need, uh, but we're not attracting discretionary. We're not attracting people who say, man, what a hassle to drive downtown, what a hassle to park downtown, the cost of parking downtown. And uh, yes, transportation, uh, 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 is always subsidized. You look around the country, it never pays for itself. Uh, but at the point we're at now, uh, we need greater incentives for people to get on it, and I'm not sure we're, we're going to produce those artificially. I think they're going to be produced by uh, continuing growth. And just to add to that a little bit, we, we got a really good report from MMT at our uh, uh, PPRTA board meeting um, yesterday, and I think we're just now back to the footprint that MMT serves that we had pre-recession levels. So it took a while to kind of get back to where we need to be. So to enhance it further and try to pick up those choice riders that have options, uh, you know, what choice riders are looking for is dependability and frequency. They want to make sure that if they miss one bus, it's, another one may show up in about 10 minutes and not have to wait around for about half an hour. So we need to look at, you know, making some hard choices and how can we really start funding a, a transit system that we need for a region of this size. I don't think we're yet connected to the airports. That's one thing we probably need to take a look at as well. And I know a lot of people scratch their heads when they fly, up, fly out and realize that we're not quite connected. So there's a lot of things like that that we'll need to look at as we're, as we're growing. And if I might add a couple of quick comments as well. Something, being an industrial engineer myself, one of the things that I talk to a lot of people about is increasing Colorado's capacity to actually simulate the infrastructure, to do a lot of different what-if simulations that can allow us to be better informed ourselves to decide what kinds of investments are going to deliver the best kinds of outputs. Because we, I don't think the state of Colorado does that exceptionally well. To give you an example of that, you can have secondary beneficial effects if you do certain types of projects. So if you were to make powers, uh, limited access, uh, from north side to south side connecting to I-25 and both, what other benefits would accrue from that? Well, you would take some traffic pressure off of I-25, which has $200 million worth of projected uh, expansion projects over the next 10 to 15 years uh, on the docket uh, at the state level. And you could also relieve some of the crosstown uh, traffic pressure because people that live on the east side would have better access to the north and south uh, uh, transportation corridor. So these are some of these cases where simulating to figure out the best investment in, uh, approach can provide uh, real value uh, to the state of Colorado. We do need to do more of that. Thank you. Tatiana, let's talk cannabis. <laughs> it's your questions. What has been the biggest impact of medical marijuana on, on our economy and what opportunities or issues do you foresee in the industry? And I'd like to also add that someone noticed, do you think the legislation of marijuana will adversely affect our SAT scores more? The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, I wrote a, a five-part um, series in the Business Journal about uh, the legalization of recreational marijuana. 
Uh, more than anything, because I was getting so many questions during Q&A, you know, is this really going to increase our K-12 funding astronomically? You know, what's good, what's bad? And I didn't really know. So I studied it and, and studied it and, and also talked to a lot of people at the state. And, uh, you know, uh, I think even Hickenlooper says this now, uh, <laughs> don't do it for the money. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, for recreational marijuana. Uh, I, I did not really study medical marijuana. My, my knee-jerk reaction on that as someone with a public health background too is that there are a lot of proven um, medical benefits. Uh, I, I just like to see it as regulated as possible. I mean, do any of us really want to put anything in our bodies or have our kids do that without having it be regulated? And I think that that's true also for, uh, for recreational marijuana. If it is gonna be out there, which is actually not my personal preference, uh, could we at least regulate it? Uh, and I don't think we've done a very good job of that, nor have we done a very good job of really educating our children about it. Uh, now, having said all that, this five-part series looked at the economic, uh, the health, uh, and the safety impacts of, um, and, and, and a few other things, of recreational marijuana. And my, my takeaway on all of it, and I wasn't really expecting this, was uh, it's not really getting us any money. It's costing us money, and uh, you know, as Hickenlooper says, don't do it for the money if it's a state that's thinking about it. So, uh, you know, again, my takeaway is do things very cautiously, and I'm not sure that as a state we did that quite as much, uh, especially on the recreational side. Uh, but on the medical side, uh, I, I would say that the benefits have been pretty substantial for a lot of people. Uh, we just have to think very carefully about how we're going to continue to roll that out. Some of the negative ramifications that we've seen with the legalization, particularly for re recreational, are going to be somewhat mitigated over time as more states legalize. Uh, so that's really my, my answer. All right. Mayor Southers? I just want to comment that I've become increasingly convinced over the last uh, couple of years that Colorado Springs, uh, being a major city that has not embraced uh, recreational marijuana, has not legalized it, has become uh, a business attraction asset for us. And I'm looking at uh, Dirk Draper over there. I thought it was incredible uh, incredibly enlightening at the last FAM tour. Uh, what a FAM tour is. We have eight people come in uh, annually that represent, uh, they're in the business, uh, they get hired by businesses to go out and check out places to move. And so a business hires them, says, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for lo uh, low utilities, we're looking for educated workforce. You go find us, you know, two or three finalists that we ought to look at. Um, out of a group of uh, eight that I had conversations with, no less than three brought up to me without any prompting the fact that uh, marijuana has become a, uh, a, a concern mark for their clients for Colorado uh, because a lot of them have drug testing. Uh, this was particularly true for precision manufacturing companies. And they were really pleased to see that Colorado Springs had not embraced uh, recreational marijuana, and uh, they thought that was something that their clients would be very interested in uh, when they evaluate uh, Colorado Springs versus other uh, places in Colorado and uh, uh, in the United States. So I think that's something we have to really keep in mind. Uh, I also uh, know that... Uh, the marijuana industry, you know, had targeted November of 2018 to go to the voters uh, in Colorado Springs. I think they were shocked to see uh, the, uh, the polling uh, showing that the uh, residents of Colorado Springs, for the most part, have turned against uh, recreational marijuana. And my personal feeling is that residential home grows have a lot to do with that. Thank you. And a couple of quick comments for me. Uh, we have not uh, authorized uh, recreational marijuana in El Paso County either. And we do have some real challenges that I think speak to the social costs that T Tatiana brought forward. So we have hundreds of illegal marijuana grows now in eastern El Paso County. These are things that our sheriff has to deal with and there's a cost associated with dealing with that uh, challenge. And I would also make a point that um, when, when, if you are a consumer of marijuana, you actually close yourself down uh, on, on a lot of job opportunities. Uh, it becomes very problematic for getting a federal job, very problematic for dealing with uh, any type of transportation job. You really close down those opportunities. <clears throat> 
when uh, you get to a place to consume marijuana. And so I, I continue to recommend to people, just don't do it. And I'll make one last point. I mean, we've got beautiful mountains here. We've got tons of trails. If there's any place in the country where you can get a natural high by going outside <laughs> and enjoy the, enjoy the environment, this is the state. It's pretty good, pretty good. Um, and also educating our kids when they're looking to get jobs for them to know that they can't be smoking cannabis uh, if they want to go into those kinds of industries. Well, One of the good things with WAM. Well, and just back to the SAT scores, the reason I said the short answer is yes is because uh, all the studies have shown that um, uh, the THC uh, triggers uh, something in the hippocampus and the amygdala of the brain. This is, that's fear receptors and uh, motivation. So, you know, all the jokes about, you know, potheads being on the couch and not moving and eating chips. I mean, there's kind of a reason that that's a, a, a stereotype. It does impact, and those impacts are magnified in the developing brain. Commissioner Vanderwerf, given the geographic and ideological dispersion in El Paso County, how can we better incorporate the various groups so that we move more uniformly towards common goals? Uh, thank you very much. It's a great question. And uh, I actually wrote <laughs> notes on that one. So I, I tell you, uh, one of the things that I think is very important uh, national politics is crazy, and when we need to solve local community problems, we need to put national politics aside, because when we decide to work together in this community, I think we can get things done. I'm here to tell you, uh, being, uh, being an elected official for two and a half years, I see an enormous amount of cooperation without regard for uh, ideology happening in this community, and it happens also with our political leaders, and I'm very proud of that and honored to be part of that, and it is something uh, that the mayor mentioned a few minutes ago. So the best way to solve community problems is for the community, the community to solve it itself, and the best way to do that is for us to work together. And we have so many things, when we think about this, we really actually have a lot of things in common. What do we have in common? Well, we all want safe neighborhoods. We all want good schools. We all want a fun place to go to on Saturday night. And we all want job opportunities. So if we start with the baseline of common ground and then work from there, some of the challenges are in how we solve those problems or how we work those problems. But actually, we've got common ground. Uh, across ideologies about what most people want in the community here. So we live together, we can work together, we can plan together, and I think we can accomplish a lot, and there's a lot of cooperation and really a good feeling about that going on right now in our community. Uh, Stan's right that one of the advantages that local government has over other levels of government is they're really there's no other option, you know. Uh, you can't be very political about whether you want to fix potholes or not, uh, whether you pick up the garbage and things like that. So there's really no, you got to get it done. And I think that's one of the, the when, one of the reasons why local government has such a higher uh, voter approval rate uh, for us here, uh, because we got to get it done and we do get it done. But I don't want to, let, let's not lose sight of the fact that there are philosophical differences. Uh, People have different views of uh, what government ought to do for them. Uh, in here in El Paso County, I call it the uh, anarchist wing of the Republican Party who doesn't believe that government ought to do anything for you. Uh, there are folks probably like Stan and I would probably be in the category that we're pretty limited government guys. I think the city ought to do police and fire. I think it ought to do public works. I think it ought to do transportation. I think it ought to do parks. Uh, but I don't think it ought to be involved in, in much else. And there are people who believe that uh, government uh, delivers uh, uh, the answers uh, to most problems. Uh, what, I, what, what I just hope we can uh, uh, achieve is intelligent conversations about it. Th these issues are ultimately going to be uh, resolved by, by voters. Uh, but but let's let's elect public officials that can engage in intelligent conversations about what government should or should not do for us. Uh, and, you know, forget all of this, uh, uh, you know, these 15 second sound uh, bites that really don't contribute to the intelligence of the conversation. And by all means, let's be civil about it. 
Uh, but no, make no mistake about it, there are differences of opinion about what the proper role of government is, and we can't avoid those folks, uh, whether it's El Paso County uh, or Denver. And I look at some of the stuff going on in Denver, I just think that's crazy stuff uh, uh, going on up there. And I'm going to fight uh, tooth and nail uh, when people advocate some of that uh, uh, stuff for here. Uh, but I uh, promise you, uh, if I'm around, I'm going to engage in intelligent conversation about it and try and convince you in terms of political leadership. Because ultimately, for me, political leadership is not just listening. Uh, yeah, I gotta listen to what you want, but I also have to take into account, hey, I appreciate that, but let me tell you what, based on my observation is, this is what you ought to want, like stormwater. You start out, people didn't give a crap about stormwater, but And we do have a question on that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you've got to convince people that they ought to want it, and that's uh, political leadership. And it, but it takes intelligent and, and civil conversation to work through these, these issues. Thank you. We have quite a few questions coming in about downtown Colorado Springs. So let's open it up and talk about the economic impact of a strong downtown and what that can do for uh, workforce and attraction of workforce. And in the same sense, uh, some of the challenges we're seeing downtown with the homeless population. Um, what are we doing to address that? So let's open it up with talking about the economic impact and then if someone would like to talk uh, homelessness after that. <laughs> Tatiana? Okay. I mean, I can talk about both, but... Uh... I'll be really quick. Uh, a, a vibrant downtown is absolutely essential uh, to the vibrancy of the city. And when I run across somebody in Briargate that says, oh, I never go downtown, I don't give a rip about downtown, uh, you know, I always uh, try and engage in the conversation. Hey, do you care about the value of your home? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I want you to know that how this city is perceived is going to be a lot about how its downtown area is perceived, and that's going to affect uh, your property values. Uh, I also, uh, you know, do you have a kid? Do you have a, uh, their, you know, their ability to, to get a job or your grandchildren to get a jobs here are going to be uh, based on how the, the city uh, as a totality moves forward and a vibrant downtown is part of that. And that, that's one of the things I'm actually most excited about is the renaissance that's taking place uh, in downtown. More people are working there, more people are living there, uh, and I think the, very, uh, the future is very bright. And, and let, me just, let me just plant a seed for you. I actually think we have the opportunity to avoid a Denver sort of situation. A lot of these, you know, headquarter, big headquarter cities have, like in the case of Denver, literally three quarters of a million people descending on downtown uh, every day to go to work. And it's just massive congestion. Look at where our major employers are. Yeah, we're growing more employers downtown. We've got uh, governments downtown. That's a major employer. Uh, I'm excited about some of these uh, technological, uh, uh, high-tech businesses down there with 250 uh, uh, people. But our massive employers are on the periphery. The military, uh, USAA. Uh, I think uh, you read in the paper today about what could be a very uh, massive uh, employer. And... We can have a downtown where we don't have, you know, three quarters of a million people pouring in every day uh, to have to go to work. And I, I think we have the opportunity to make it economically vibrant, vibrant but also just a very, very attractive place uh, for our citizens. And I would like to say, I think uh, um, uh, the downtown partnership, the Urban Renewal Authority, uh, the leadership of the city of Colorado Springs, and a large contribution of activities that the county is involved in. We're working together to work on both the problems that we have downtown, but really also a strategic investment in growing downtown in, into a much more vibrant kind of community uh, or area than we've had in the past. We do have some areas downtown, we all are well aware of them, uh, that can, take, that can uh, benefit uh, greatly from uh, development, but you know that process is started. There's apartment uh, uh, buildings going on down there. There's new hotels going on down there. Uh, we have um, the Olympic Museum that is under construction. And I don't know what you might think, but when I look at that building, and I work in a building very close to it, it's not even done yet, and it's already beautiful. 
So there's a lot going on downtown that's, I think, happening because of, again, because of cooperation that's taking place. With regard to the homeless side, there's an enormous number of nonprofits and public agency engagement in that. Uh, El Paso County has 350 caseworkers that help people who have needs uh, day in and day out. And between the Pikes Peak Workforce Center and the Department of Human Services, we have programs going on to help people that are in need, many of whom are homeless, uh, to get not only get out of the whatever blockage they have that might have caused the homeless to begin with, but to also get them job skills so they can get into a job, so they can be self-sustaining and they can get, get on with their lives. And if there's any time in our community to be doing that kind of thing, to get folks like this into a job, it's now because our industries need employees. So this is the time for us to work it. So the county is a key partner along with all the other public agencies and the nonprofits that are really doing yeoman's work to work on those kinds of issues. I just think we stay the course and do the best we can. We all know that homelessness will never go away. It has never gone away in any other city either. It's all a matter of doing what we can uh, as, as community leaders and as citizens to help with that issue. All right, and then to close, would each of you like to spend 30 seconds talking about what you are most excited for when it comes to uh, the future of Colorado Springs and how it's gonna affect the local business community? You get to go first, Mayor Southers. 30 seconds. Co Colorado Springs has, you know, we've always been a beautiful place to be. Uh, we can be one of the premier uh, large cities in America. You know, we're the, we're the 39th largest city in America. A lot of people have no clue uh, we're that large. Um, we're going to get larger, and there's no, uh, th that horse is out of the barn. Uh, it's just too attractive a place. People are going to move here. We do have the resources uh, to accommodate up to a million people. So the city's going to get bigger, and we have a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and think about uh, what a challenge it is. We want to be able to say 30 years from now, we're still the most desirable city in America. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know I, every speech I give, people get sick of it, but this is the goal, folks. We gotta continue to build a city that matches our scenery. And we gotta think about every strategic move we make. Uh, are we capitalizing uh, on the tremendous assets uh, that we've got and not undermining uh, those assets? That, that has to be our focus moving forward. Thank you very much. Well, I have to tell you, I'm very excited uh, about uh, the vibe that we have in our community today. And I, while I've already mentioned it once before, I think the number one and most important quality, the one that uh, I enjoy, with, uh, enjoy working in the most, is the cooperation that's going on. It's really fantastic. The number one challenge that we have is to keep that cooperation going. Uh, with that, there's nothing we can't do. And I'll, I'll offer a challenge to you. Everyone in this room has a passion. Whatever that passion is, I hope you're volunteering somewhere uh, to, to scratch that itch about what your passion is. And if you aren't, go do it because there's a place somewhere in this community where you can do more of that and get involved and get engaged and be part of the answer, part of the solution for our community. Uh, it's a great time to be in El Paso County in Colorado Springs. And I see, uh, while we've got plenty of challenges, and one of those is growth and in, a couple of growth and in infrastructure that we've talked about, we are on our way to becoming the best city in the country and the best county in the nation. Thank you. Um, relative newcomers, I feel like I'm part of the problem with the in-migration that Tatiana talked about a lot. <laughs> moved here, so I moved here last year from back in the D.C. area, but a couple of things that really appealed to me was the regional cooperation, the spirit of collaboration that was already in place. That was really appealing to me, and not just with the RTA that we have in place for transportation uh, projects, but regional building as a former planning director, I kind of geek out on stuff like that. So there's just a great spirit of cooperation already to, to Stan's point. Um, also like the fact that we're investing a lot in the downtown area that kind of appealed to me as well because that really showed me that this is a community that really gets it and they know where they want to go. So we just want to keep building on that. We know we've got some real challenges as far as transportation funding again at the state level. We've got ideas as far as how to maybe try to break through that, but um, we, I think we've got some really good opportunities to come up with a long-term plan and a long-term vision that's gonna work for all of us, and if we can work proactively, we can, I think we can get after it. Thank you. Well, besides being excited for happy hour, I'm also excited uh, 
and this is from the data geek, right? Uh, I'm really excited about how inquisitive uh, people are and how much they're willing to listen. And I think part of the reason that the forum has done really well is because I'll go up, uh, you know, and do presentations or I'll hand out uh, dashboards and people are s so engaged in the conversation, uh, much more so than anything that I've seen in any other city that I've lived. And uh, that is probably an offshoot of some of the other things that, that have been mentioned. We didn't do very well for very long, uh, for a long time, and now we are doing really well, so I think people are excited. The, uh, we have strong mayor, very popular mayor, great uh, leadership in other realms as well, uh, and that willingness, of course, for people to work together. So from my perspective, from my little you know, corner of the room, I'm able to go up and, and give good information, government-sourced information um, to, to individuals, and the community's using it. Uh, and, and I think my, my own personal bias is that if we continue to do that and we make good informed decisions, with, all, with this uh, environment that we're in right now, things could really, uh, really take off for us in the most wonderful way. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna have you all stay seated as I conclude the event. Thank you to all the sponsors who make the UCCS Economic Forum possible. Sponsors can pick up their trifolds at the registration table. These sponsors enable the UCCS Economic Forum to continue being the leading source of unbiased and rigorous information for the Pikes Peak region. Data is continuously updated and actively utilized in the community to inform and drive economic development and business decisions.